And again, I want to just welcome everyone to our core coffee chat this morning, where we're going to hear about local responses to a global issue preventing sexual assault in Santa Cruz County with our special guests from Monarch Services. I'm Nicole Young, and I'm joined by my co-host, Nicole Lezen, and together we facilitate the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, or Core Investments which I'll explain in a moment. We always start off with a little overview of what CORE is. Uh, and so CORE, again, stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And it's both a funding model and a broader movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in our county. And we do that using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And over the last few years, CORE has really grown and evolved into much more than just a way to give out grants. That again, it's this broader movement to inspire and ignite collective action, to work together to create safe, healthy communities that have equitable opportunities for everyone to thrive. So notice how equity is front and center in both our mission and vision. And these were created with a lot of input from uh, different partners and nonprofits and public agencies, people like all of you on, on today's call. Next slide. And when we talk about equitable health and well-being, we mean that across the lifespan, that everybody has equitable opportunities to experience these eight core conditions for health and well-being that we see as very interconnected and interdependent, um, and that we want to get to a place where <clears throat> opportunities and uh, outcomes can't be predicted for better or worse by things like race, ethnicity, the zip code where you live, your age or your income level. And so that in order to be able to achieve that vision, it really requires all of us to work together in, in, in the many of the ways that we already are to have conversations like what we're having today. Um, so really as both a funding model and a movement, CORE gives us a framework or a way of talking about how we align priorities and programs and policies and funding and our results around common community goals and, uh, and again, work together to achieve those. And just to, you know, we sometimes sound like a broken record on this, but we do like to make it really clear that equity is at the center of this diagram. And, and we really focus specifically on racial equity um, to, to really remind ourselves and illustrate that in order to create those equitable opportunities and outcomes, we really have to be willing and able to examine and address our individual organizational and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that uh, often perpetuate the very inequities that we're trying to eliminate. And so we hope that through events like this core coffee chat, that, that helps us, that gives us language and skills and tools to be able to do that. You go to the next slide, Nicole. These coffee chats and core conversations and other trainings that we offer are under the umbrella of what we call the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. Uh, and the Core Institute is really a relatively new name to describe the variety of things that we do to try to, again, build shared knowledge and skills and capacity to really uh, utilize and implement that core framework and those core conditions. So at this point, I will turn it back over to Nicole Lezen. Thanks, Nicole. And thanks everyone for joining us for today's talk in honor of Sexual Assault Awareness Month. But as you'll hear from our three guest speakers from Monarch Services, we hope that the information you get today will help you think about this month all year, which is what we all need to be doing. So um, I'd like to welcome first our, um, our guest, Kayleen Foster Renduff, who's the co-executive director of Monarch Services. And she is joined um, by Maria Barranco and Leanne Luna, who are program managers with Monarch. So we're gonna start out with um, Kayleen giving us an overview of the state and national context for this work. Um, and especially ways, as, as Nicole mentioned, with equity at the center of core, ways that equity is um, showing up in different ways in, in the, the um, sexual assault awareness movement as well. Maria is going to talk to us more about what's happening locally, some recent um, work here in our county and some ways that we can all be aware of some new interventions and um, new opportunities. 
And then Leanne Luna is going to talk to us about some specific issues related to children and youth where, where the greatest prevention opportunities might be. So throughout their presentations, and I'll turn it over to them in just a second, we encourage you to provide your questions and comments in the chat. Nicole and I will gather those. And then after we hear from Kayleen, Maria, and Leanne, we'll have a chance to ask them questions directly. So please hold your questions until then, but keep them flowing in the chat. And we'll um, have a chance to just turn off the, the mute buttons and turn on your cameras and just yeah. have a, a real conversation um, before we wrap up at the end of the hour. So thanks again for being with us. And Kaylin, over to you. Lovely. Thank you so much. I would like to thank all of you this morning for joining us for this important conversation. Um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month does take place in April, and um, so it's a great opportunity to bring this community conversation to all of you, and we appreciate that. At Monarch, um, for those of you that don't know, we have a 45-year history within uh, Santa Cruz County. We work with sexual assault, domestic violence, and human trafficking survivors. And our mission is lives free from violence and abuse. So um, we look at prevention as the key to being able to get to our mission. And we are very lucky in the state of California to have a state coalition that was formerly CalCASA, um, just changed their name within the last month to Valor. And they are extremely focused on equity and do a huge amount of resource development and um, and systemic change both nationally and statewide um, and that directs us effectively here in Santa Cruz County. Their number one uh, lens is on equity and what we do know from research and from historical data the, the sexual assault movement collecting of data is about 45 years um, and we know that sexual assault is a product and producer of social inequity. Um, it primarily affects women and communities of color. And so we have to ask the question, why? What is happening and how do we prevent that from happening? So in order to do that, um, we need to understand power, how violence is used to boost power for some and diminish power for others, and how it begins devaluing human life and how we correct that and be able to move forward so that our communities are free from violence and we um, both are survivor-centered and also looking at how the justice system um, perhaps is not the, the solution the way that it is framed now in order to um, to take these inequities away and to solve the problem of sexual violence within our communities. So we are very focused on that at Monarch. It is part of um, our everyday and our conversation and what drives us forward is being able to prevent sexual assault from happening in our community. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Maria Barranco, who's gonna talk a little bit about our prevention work and some of the trends we see in Santa Cruz County currently. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. And first of all, I want to um, point out that what I'm going to be talking about is not just the community, but also um, rape culture, which is a global issue, right? Um, and really, the typical narrative that we always have in regards to rape culture is, is that it perpetuates the belief um, the victims have contributed to their own victimization um, and are responsible for what has happened to them, right? It is an environment in which rape is prevalent and in which sexual violence against women is normalized, just like uh, Kaylin mentioned earlier, and also an excuse in media and popular culture. So I think it's very important for us that uh, knowing that living in this rape culture is harmful. Um, it is in all of our best interest to start calling it out, um, specifically because, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the fact that there is victim blaming, pressuring, uh, you know, really pressuring the, go the government to address issues, um, our local government, which is really important as well. Um, so what can we do as a community? Uh, there is many things that we can do. We'll talk about what Monarch Services does and our prevention program, um, but it is, it is important to examine uh, which aspects of our beliefs attitudes and behaviors need to change. Um, in addition, I think it's important that we also talk about when uh, we're talking about sexual assault in rape culture, um, that we avoid using language that objectifies. Um, 
we need to challenge those who are using those languages. Um, we need to speak out uh, to some uh, and hear someone else making um, an offensive joke or in regards to sexual assault. Many times as a community, unfortunately, because we have been um, so into the rape culture and not understanding what rape culture means. So I do want to also talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit more because really uh, rape cases are not being reported. Um, in Santa Cruz County alone during COVID, unfortunately, um, many of our rape cases were not reported, not only because of the fact that many of our survivors were at home with those who were perpetrating them, um, but in addition, there is the fear of reporting for many, many um, reasons. Um, and uh, just alone, 12.1 million estimated numbers of U.S. women who have been raped. 69% um, of rape victims who are somewhat or extremely concerned that others would blame them or hold them responsible. As I mentioned earlier, rape cases are not being reported, but also if a survivor does not report, unfortunately, police not, might not investigate. Um, and then prosecution often refuses to take up cases that the police do not um, uh, recommend. Uh, and so it is important, again, for us to really be very mindful in regards to our role in this rape culture and how we have contributed in really perpetuating this and how can we as a community, specifically in Santa Cruz County, right, um, how can we make a shift and really change that um, and have a different conversation and change the narrative for our survivors. Um, in addition, it is important to note that um, rape is more likely to happen to younger women. Um, and, and so it is important to, to acknowledge that once again, many of our survivors are not going to report because people think that rape survivors are making it up. Um, and in addition, unfortunately, the person who causes harm or the rapist uh, may not be convicted to the fullest extent. Um, so we do need to take those steps. Nicole, thank you. And um, so Monarch Services and our response team, um, we have a SART program. And what is our SART program? is a group of individuals who um, come together to provide support to our survivors. Um, however, of course, really the goal of Monarch is to prevent um, from this from happening in the first place, right? Really examining our beliefs and um, ensuring that we're uh, doing something before it leads to um, a sexual assault examination, which I will go into um, shortly. So what is a, a, a SART? Um, is a team of first responders that involves um, the safe examiner um, where uh, evidence is, forensic evidence is collected after a sexual assault. Um, this team is consists of monarch services. We have over 20 advocates who are available 24 hours a day to provide um, not only support, but uh, but also trauma-informed services to these survivors who have just been in such a traumatic situation. Um, and additionally, there's also specialized trained um, medical professionals. And if survivor chooses to have law enforcement, law enforcement would also be uh, present. Um, Safe exams have been available since 1985. So I think it is important for us to know that in our community, since 1985, we have been available, but for the past two years and a half, um, they were being taken place at Valley Medical Center in Santa Clara. Uh, unfortunately, that prevented and gave, um, there were several challenges um, that we experienced with, with that. Uh, just recently in um, 2020, um, October of 2020, um, the SART team returned to once again to Santa Cruz and we're currently responding to adult uh, sexual assault examinations um, at Dominican Hospital. We continue to respond to pediatric um, examinations over at Valley Medical Center due to the fact that they do have a very uh, comprehensive um, programming for youth. Um, and it, it is also important that while, uh, while some of the, um, the data we don't have most of the data because unfortunately, as I mentioned, during COVID um, in 2020, uh, many survivors 
did not report. However, uh, Monitor Services data does show that just alone, we served 520 survivors of um, sexual assault, and that is through our different programs. Um, as for reports um, that went through sexual assault examinations, um, it was under 50. And so that tells us in regards to where are we as a community and the fact that, again, there needs to be more information and more awareness about um, not only our services, but to ensure that, again, survivors are being supported. Um, survivors have, and I think it's important for us as a community, especially um, service providers, um, friends, family, if we do come across any individual who is or has been sexually assaulted knowing that they have options. And their option is not only to report, but rather um, there is what we call um, the investigative um, SART. And the investigative involves um, the team, as I mentioned earlier, but it also involves law enforcement if the survivor chooses to make a report. Um, now, if the survivor is not ready, because as we know, trauma can bring so many um, challenges to our survivors, right? And so it is important to know that if our if someone is not ready to report, uh, it is important for them to know that they still have time to be able to, one, not report at all, um, two, uh, have an investigative or have what we call a non-investigative um, examination. The non-investigative examination is um, involves uh, monarch services if the survivor wishes to have an advocate, the nurse examiner, but does not involve law enforcement. As we know, many times survivors uh, do not want to um, proceed with any investigation. Similar to what I just mentioned, right? Many of the cases um, might not be investigated. Um, and also survivors do have up to 10 days to be able to report if they choose to. Um, one of the things that I would you know, encourage for the community is that uh, first off, if a survivor does come to you, um, to please make sure that you listen, believe them, and provide them with the option of contacting Monarch Services in order for us to be able to discuss with them um, further in regards to their um, different options. Thank you, Nicole. If you can be great. Wonderful. And, and so um, it is important also to note that um, some of our services our prevention um, department is um, working on, as I mentioned earlier, how can we as a community uh, work together? And that is um, speaking out, being an active bystander. Um, some of the um, activities or events that Monarch Services does is that we are very invested in primary prevention and working with the community um, in a very holistic way to ensure that, again, we're changing this narrative. Um, we, we hold monthly um, webinars, um, including uh, on different topics, um, including uh, uh, bystander intervention to educate the community uh, and, of course, creating awareness events of sexual violence um, and really changing the gender norms, uh, which is very important. Education, workshops, uh, training and outreach to our community to ensure that, again, we are giving a stronger message that um, that challenges uh, rape and the myths that promote empathy for victims. Um, education's in school, and Leanne will talk a little bit more about the fact that, you know, we believe, uh, Monarch Services believes strongly in early education and ensuring that this information goes to our younger uh, generation as they can make a, a huge difference. And then, of course, um, education around uh, sexual violence before it occurs, uh, which is extremely important. Um, as well. And um, with that, I am going to go ahead and um, pass it on to Leanne Luna. Hello, everybody. I think, are we moving to the next slide? All right, perfect. Um, 
So um, as I mentioned, or as Maria mentioned, thank you. I'm Leanne Luna, I'm one of the program managers over at Monarch. Um, so I'm gonna start out by talking a little bit about some of the barriers and resources as to why um, some of our child and youth in, you know, don't report. Um, so a few things, um, of course there is, you know, the possibility that they are unaware of the resources that are available to them in the community. Um, there's a lot of shame that goes into, um, you know, reporting. Um, I think one of the really um, important things to mention here is that so many, the data really shows that there are a lot of, not just with child and youth, of course, with adults as well, but especially with, with child and youth who have been um, sexually assaulted, they often know the person who's who has done this to them, who has caused this harm. So that comes with a lot of um, added barriers and challenges because if it is somebody, um, uh, if there is somebody that is, you know, a an uncle or a father or a stepfather or somebody like that, um, or a stepmother, you know, it gets really tricky. And so there's a lot of fear about why they will not, um, you know, share that. And then I think the other piece of it is that, um, there is the fear that they are not going to be believed. Um, there is definitely a really, um, you know, I, I just want to also mention, I'll just back up for a second, is that there is a really strong trend of youth sexual assault. Um, and, you know, in, in talking about the victim blaming, it becomes really tricky because, you know, that's something that we always want to, um, that we stress at Monarch as advocates, is that we want to make sure that we are expressing that we believe those who are coming forward. It's so important. And, you know, unfortunately, there's oftentimes that a lot of the child and youth that we work with, um, they have expressed that, you know, they have gone to, you know, their parent or their a sibling or an aunt or somebody in the family and disclosed what's happened to them, and they have not been believed. And so oftentimes, you know, they just totally put their guard up and, you know, don't um, say anything any further and then don't seek that support that they that is very much needed um and you know there's um you know we were having a conversation about this yesterday that you know when we look really look at the research research um specifically from the aces study it shows that individuals who have experienced um you know you know trauma um they're at a much more significantly increased risk of more serious health challenges later in their life and so um, that's why it is so important for, you know, folks to, you know, be able to get into, um, support from a lot of the community resources that are out there. Um, you know, like I said, most of the assaults occur in the victim's home, neighborhood, or school. Um, and so one of the really wonderful, um, resources that we have in Santa Cruz County is the Sky Center, um, short for Safe Kids and Youth Center. And so, um, that has been open now, Kaylin, correct me if I'm wrong, has it been three years now that that's been open? Uh, I think four, but four. Around, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and so what the Sky Center is, is so, um, whenever there is an interview that is conducted, so if a child or youth or teen, you know, anywhere between the ages of zero to 14 that, di um, discloses, um, not just sexual assault, but even domestic violence, um, then the interview is held at the Sky Center. And so the, the thought around that is, you know, to kind of remove the child or, to, you know, youth from, you know, being in a um, law enforcement agency in an interrogation room that's obviously very scary um, and very intimidating and to, you know, have a, a much safer and trauma-informed space. Um, and so the team that is there for all of the interviews is, uh, the interview, the forensic interviewer, of course, um, and right now that is um, a, a woman from the DA's office. Um, the DA is also part of the interviews, the local law enforcement agency, victim witness, and then Monarch Services, an advocate from our agency. So we are there um, to support the family and the child, um, and our role is, you know, that when the, when the child is being interviewed, then we are with the family or support person. Um, and so that we can explain the services that we offer at our agency so that we can ensure that they are, you know, well-equipped with, um, you know, somebody who is providing that 
to them, but also <clears throat> to explain the process, because obviously this is, you know, oftentimes this is the first time they've ever been through something like this. So we go through all of the options that are available to them and really, you know, help them understand what the next steps are going to be. Thank you, that. Okay. Um, and so some of the resources for survivors and advocates, um, we have some bystander intervention resources. Um, so the Valor US is the bystander intervention mixtape to prevent systemic and uh, intercommunal violence. Um, they work on grounding, you know, their work in empathy, reconciliation, and racial, racial justice activism. They, Valor US, I just want to point out, they were previously known as CalCASA, the California Coalition um, Against Sexual Assault. So um, there's some, the link here, and then of course our 24 hour bilingual crisis line. One thing I also really want to stress, um, especially since we have some, you know, some additional providers on the call here, is that Monarch Services, um, our child and youth program will respond out to um, schools. Um, that's one of the things that we, um, I don't know if everybody's aware that that's one of the um, services that we provide. And so I think it's really important to point that out because when we talk about the importance of getting our child and youth the support services when they've experienced, you know, these types of traumas, um, and, and I'll give you an example. So oftentimes we are called by administrators within the PBUSD or Santa Cruz um, School District. And, you know, if they have a a student who is who has disclosed abuse, maybe they are law enforcement has already been called. Um, so we will go out and be there so that we can meet with the student and also provide our resources and then follow up, of course, for them and even their family. So um, that is obviously during COVID that has been a little tricky. Um, and we have had not um, a lot of disclosures. You know, we've had a lot of conversations with the folks that we have um, really good partnerships with it, uh, within the school system. And, um, you know, there, there obviously has been a decline. You know, we've gotten um, also had some conversations about this with um, folks from Family and Children's Services. And so, you know, there has obviously because students have not been in school and have not had access to their administrators, teachers, counselors as they once were, um, there was definitely a decline. However, now that things are picking up, um, we have definitely seen that there has been an increase. Um, so like, for example, at the Sky Center, you know, we often, you know, are there several times during the week. Um, and this is, you know, I'm talking prior to COVID. And so now that things are ramping up a bit more, we are now starting to be called upon much more. Um, you know, we've been there quite a bit within the last few weeks. And so that just goes to show that, you know, as that kids are having more access to, you know, those trusted adults that are outside of their home, um, you know, there has been more of that disclosure. And so, um, and we also provide um, uh, weekly support groups at some local high schools, and we're hoping to expand that, you know, in the, in the coming year. Um, but just wanted to, you know, mention that so folks know what is available to them. So um, uh, some more resources that are available, um, there's a social media toolkit um, and you can access this link here to help customize social media campaigns uh, with high school and college versions. And so um, I definitely encourage everybody to check out some of these websites so that um, you can kind of dive in a bit more and see what other um, resources are available in regard to social media. We can. Okay. Thanks to all of you. Um, there was a lot of information flowing, a lot of mm -hmm. insights, a lot of um, local information. And what, one thing I did not see were a lot of questions in the chat. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that you were just saving them up. And so please feel free to use the reaction buttons to raise your hand for us or add something to the chat now. Um, what, what questions do you have for Kaylin? Maria and Leanne that they could, while we're all together, that they could respond to for you or, or do you have comments for each other? Things that you were wondering about, reactions to the information? 
Um, Nicole, I also just want to stress that, you know, myself, Kaylin, Maria, you know, we are more than happy to answer any questions, you know, like if something just comes up um, in your organization or, you know, just with somebody that you come into contact with, we are more than happy to, you know, just answer some questions and maybe you're not totally sure about all of the resources that would be available to them. Um, so I just want to throw that out there, you know, that, you know, we are definitely um, available. And while we are not back in the offices quite yet, um, we are still very much working. And so we're happy to do that too. Thanks, Leanne. That's, that's yeah. a good point. This is not your last chance to ask questions or get more information. <laughs> and I, I know many people on the call have, have worked with you and others in the community working on these issues too in the past. So good reminder. So what, what kinds of things are going on in your own organizations? Has anyone gone through any kind of uh, trainings or um, referred people to the Sky Center? What are your experiences with, with what's been going on during COVID? Are you, are you experiencing some of the same things with your, uh, with your clients that you're hearing about from, from the team here? So Rosalina has a question in the chat. What's the current status of possible shelter or hotel voucher assistant for, assistance for individuals who reach out to your organizations? Yeah, thank you, for asking that question. thank you for asking that question and I'm happy to um, answer that. Uh, definitely Monarch Services has seen a uh, more than a 40% um, increase in services, not only with our crisis line, but also with our motel and shelter services. We do have our only confidential shelter in Santa Cruz County um, for survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and, and human trafficking. Alone last year, we served um, with both combined our shelter and motel services, over 180 um, families, providing over thousands of bed nights, which has been just not only amazing, but at the same time concerning because we know that um, housing situation and specifically during the pandemic, how uh, accessibility and services really impacted our survivors. Um, and so, if anyone who is in need of, um, who is a survivor of domestic violence, sexual assault, or human trafficking is in need of a night stay in a motel or they need um, more longer term emergency confidential shelter, um, please refer them to our crisis line. We are available 24 hours a day to ensure that we are supporting that individual. In addition, um, we also serve those who are incarcerated and who are leaving um, the system and that night and they are not uh, feeling safe. We want to, again, Monarch's goal is to ensure that we are preventing um, any violence from happening. So if you see that there's an individual out on the streets at 2 a.m. and they might uh, you know, be exposed to potential sexual violence, um, please call us because we're more than happy to provide those services to them. And Maria, do I remember correctly that that someone has also um, arranged or donated uh, pet shelters so that if somebody's afraid of leaving their home because they don't want to leave a pet behind, you can accommodate some of that as well. Exactly. So our shelter program is very is very holistic and we want to make sure that um, we bring all the programming to our shelter. Um, as we know, many survivors uh, will not leave their abusive situations due to the fact that their um, furry family are their, their family, right? And so um, we do make accommodations. We bring pets into our shelter program. In addition, in addition, we also collaborate with programs such as Bed and Biscuits to make sure that if a survivor is willing to board their pet, um, they're more than uh, welcome to as well. Um, Monarch Services Shelter is also working on really recreating a program where we can just have a more family-friendly backyard, pet-friendly backyard, to ensure that, again, we're taking more survivors. Um, yet, uh, I do want to point out that we don't turn anyone away regardless. Um, in our shelter program, we do serve all survivors, regardless of race or gender. All of our services are bilingual and are free. Um, and again, if Monarch is unable to, for some reason, um, accommodate a situation, we look at alternatives and we make sure that we connect them with the services um, so we don't turn anyone away. Everyone is welcome to call our, um, for our services. Important message. Thank you. And thank you, Rosalina, for the question. 
Are there other questions for the team, other situations you're you're concerned about or or resources that you would like more information on? And Nicole, if I can point out, because I know that again, um, April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And I think really not only as um, both of you mentioned earlier, right? This is it's not just April that we need to really pay attention on what is happening in our community. Um, However, this month is a time for us to reflect on how sexual assault um, affects every person in our community and how can we as a community and service providers come together to make sure that we make that change. And as we uh, mentioned earlier, how can we really change that narrative that unfortunately historically has been a rape culture? Um, and I want to I want to invite everyone to participate um, in all of these conversations, not only with Monarch Services that we have every month during our webinars, but also there is an event happening um, later on, the Bystander Movement Virtual Conversation that is going to be held by the Commission for Prevention of Violence and um, the SART team. Um, you know, I think that really participating in that and having those conversations is essential for our community. Uh, if we want to make a change, that is where we need to start. So I just want to invite us to that. Also, uh, April 29th, there is going to be protecting kids um, from sexual abuse without scaring. Um, and uh, we just held our webinar on sexual assault and bystander intervention and consent. I, I want to invite you as well. If you're interested, we do have a, um, not only Monarch Services has Facebook, but we also have Instagram and um, our YouTube channel where we promote all of our different webinars in order for us to educate that community. And Maria, I'll just point out, if anyone's interested in the, the events that Maria is talking about, they are uh, listed on Monarch's website, which Gisela just put into the chat. So you can find that easily and look at the calendar and, and, and find out more about how to link up to those. Correct. Great. Um, Nicole, I think I'll just mention one other thing because I know um, when both Maria and I were talking about the Sky Center and the start, um, we talked a lot about like our part, you know, our work with law enforcement during, you know, those specific um, interviews and exams. But I do want to mention that um, we do not, that is not like a requirement at all of um, providing support to sexual assault um, survivors. So there does not have to be that, you know, a, an ongoing case with the DA or law enforcement um, at all. It's just if you are a survivor, you know, and want support, then, you know, our door is, is open. So just wanted to mention that. Great. Thanks, Leanne. Any other questions or comments? Any other um, resources that people on the call want to bring forward other than the ones we've already heard about. I'm sure there are other things going on in this this month and year round. Miguel has a question in the chat about whether there's any help for minors to, to educate them regarding avoiding uh, being a sexual assault victim. What, what's specific for, for youth in our county? So uh, both Leanne and I can speak on that. And I think that, um, again, as we mentioned earlier, not only Monarch Services is invested on that, but there's uh, certainly other programs. But I'm going to talk about Monarch Services. Um, our prevention program and our children youth program collaborate and are very invested in ensuring that, again, we are um, providing education to the youngest, um, right? To, although we are primarily right now focusing on um, uh, middle schools and high schools, our goal is to go deeper into the younger generation because we know that, um, again, we want to make sure not only that um, we are preventing violence, however, that um, those who might have experienced the traumatic situation, uh, there might be a possibility that they also, uh, you know, will be inflicting that violence. Um, so we do hold, um, as Leanne mentioned earlier, we do hold um, support groups, but we also uh, hold workshops and educational uh, workshops with the schools. So if you know, um, and you know, we're constantly trying to educate the, um, the edu educational system. So if you know of anyone who needs any of these services, we are more than happy to tailor any of our presentations um, on whatever topic you require in order for us to, again, prevent that from happening. 
Okay, thanks, Maria. And thanks, Miguel, for the question. I'll add to that that we are currently, we have been um, working with County Office of Education for a long period of time. And one of the things that that COVID has really highlighted for us is that, um, you know, youth don't know what their resources are. And if they don't have access to understanding what those resources are, they can't access them clearly. Um, and that was such, such a um, problem during COVID. And so we are developing a small business card with the SART team that every student in Santa Cruz County will be able to get access to, um, that they can have, they'll get it as part of their fall enrollment package um, of resources that are available and also what is sexual assault? What does it look like? It can be so confusing when it is a boyfriend, when it is a friend of yours and you're at a party. Um, and so being able to dispel that and so that, and it can feel very shameful for uh, a, a youth to go to a teacher or go to somebody else if, if it's not clear for them. So that is something that will be available. And we really always welcome um, ideas from our community members and folks that are working with youth in particular um, to be able to access youth and to be able to, like Maria and Leanne have talked about so um, eloquently, shifting the narrative of um, being able to, you know, reduce rate culture. It is the smog we all breathe. I say inequity is the smog we all breathe. We don't even know um, that we're living it. And it's it's out there constantly and creates these, um, you know, the violence in our, in our community. So we welcome ideas, but those resources will be going out to students. Great, great to hear. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay, Nicole, I'm wondering if we should do some wrap up. If you have any last minute questions as we're, as we're talking about what's coming next for the CORE Institute, please feel free to keep them coming in the chat. And as all three of our guests from Monarch mentioned, this is just an opportunity right now, but they're open to your ideas, suggestions, invitations to come to their organizations um, anytime. So please reach out to them as well and check out the resources that have been shared. Thank you, Kaylin, Leanne, Maria, for, um, for all the information you shared and for being with us today. We know how busy you all are and we appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us and the other people on our call today. So um, let me turn this back over to Nicole who will take it home. Great. Thanks, Nicole. And just want to echo my thanks also for this uh, really great presentation and, and discussion. Um, we would love to get everyone's feedback about today's coffee chat. Uh, and so Giselle is going to post the links to these surveys. You can do it in English or Spanish. Uh, we really do take a look at the comments, the feedback. It helps us plan future sessions and see uh, what works well and what we could do better. Uh, you could either click on the link directly in the chat or you can use your camera uh, app on your smartphone if you have one to scan the QR code and that will take you directly to SurveyMonkey. Um, and then coming up, we have a couple events that we want to highlight. We, and if you want to go to the next slide, Nicole. Uh, we just opened up the registration this morning for next week's coffee chat. It's going to be Kind of an open-ended discussion, so less of a presentation, more of a discussion. We really want to hear um, grantee perspectives. So if you're an organization that is often having to chase the grants, <laughs> whether it's you know government grants or you know foundation grants or corporate grants, uh, we would love to hear your examples and stories about you know funding practices that work well versus ones that are more challenging. Um, you know, if you could create your dream funding process, what would that look like? So really the theme is, you know, help us understand and, and learn together about funding practices that build trust, capacity, impact, and equity. And just wanna say, you know, this isn't about a particular funder or funding process at this point. Um, but we do want to gather input and ideas and examples that could be beneficial and helpful to our local funders, as many of them are starting to think about upcoming funding processes like CORE um, and, you know, and our other cities and local, you know, local funders. And so think broadly, we would love to hear, again, uh, a lot of different examples. In the future, we'll have 
similar sessions, but focused on the funder perspective. So again, we'll, Nicole and I will be facilitating the discussion, but it's not like a training or, or actual presentation. So it's really gonna depend on people's participation to make it interesting. Uh, and then we also, as you some of you know, we have been co-hosting and supporting First Five Santa Cruz County in their efforts to put on a series of ACES Aware Network of Care learning sessions. And the topics have uh, varied from session to session. We're coming up on our fifth session out of six that, that are taking place. And so next month, the topic will focus on building and strengthening network connections across you know, healthcare providers and social services and education and, and the community. Um, we're hoping to actually open up that registration uh, either later today or tomorrow morning. So keep an eye out for that email as well. And then we have a, we're, Nicole and I are participating in, we're guest speakers at a training on Data Share Santa Cruz County. Um, the training itself is being organized by the new Data Share. Uh, administrative partners and coordinators, but we're, since we are very, very active on data share and I <laughs> really learned to use it ourselves and, and we've embedded the core results menu on there, uh, we are sharing some examples of how we use it. So we'll send all these links out uh, in the follow-up email, but just wanted to highlight these today. And then follow the day after that training, um, instead of a structured coffee chat like this, we're, we're holding kind of open core office hours where Anybody that either participated in the May 10th training or maybe you missed it and you want to get some more hands-on help and, and practice using data share to find relevant data or to create reports or create dashboards, we're just going to have an open office hours where anybody can, we're still asking you to register, but you can come with your questions and we'll work through them together and um, hope, hopefully kind of build the confidence and skills and, and capacity to use this great tool that we have available to us. So again, we'll send all these links in our follow-up email, but uh, we and we have more events that we're working on scheduling. So keep an eye out for those. I think that is it for today, unless anybody, and we'll stay on for a few more minutes in case anybody has other questions or other suggestions. And thanks, Dina um, has posted some of the event bright links for the 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 events the. Um, bystander conversation that Maria mentioned to make it easy to get there so you don't have to even go to the website. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. Hopefully we'll see you next week. <laughs>